Well, when it comes to company size, the stock market has small, mid, and large caps, and that's where most companies live. But there are extreme levels where other stocks can be found. The tiniest among these are micro caps. And then at the opposite spectrum are the very biggest of companies known as mega caps. And today's audience requested ETF battle is actually a triple header between a pair of mega cap ETFs versus a plain vanilla S&P 500 ETF. So who wins the battle? Find out right after this. We've reached the end of the line for season four of ETF battles, and we did some magnificent ETF matchups this year from dividend funds to crypto and AI, along with fixed income and international stocks. So what were some of your favorite matchups for this year? Let me know in the comment section below. By the way, the full season four playlist is uh, just above that comment section, so be sure to visit it and uh, binge watch. Also, I want to give a huge thanks to all of our loyal viewers, especially those of you that sent us your ETF battle requests. Also, our program sponsor, Direction. Be sure to check out their ETF lineup. And, of course, a huge thanks to our judges for their timely and awesome analysis. Season 5 is coming in 2024, so keep your ETF battle requests coming. Send me your ETF ticker symbols in the comment section below or on our X feed at ETF Guide. Today's triple header ETF contest was requested by a viewer named Juju Buddha. And it's between a pair of mega cap ETFs, XLG from Invesco and IWY from iShares versus the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF, VU. And we know that mega cap ETFs have dominated this year's equity performance, but does it continue? And what's the best way to position your ETF portfolio? Well, let's find out. Judging today's triple header, we've got Dave Krinsis with ETF Portfolio Management and Ethan Farisagas with Bloomberg. Guys, welcome back to ETF Battles and this final episode of Season 4. Great to see both of you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be uh, wrapping up the year this episode. Hey, Ron, Ethan, great to see you guys. So we're going to blaze through the four battle categories, cost, exposure, strategy, performance, and then the mystery category where you, our judges, can pick that single factor or maybe multiple factors that you feel are pertinent and relevant to today's uh, ETF matchups. You can also nominate wildcard ETFs if you feel there's better choices elsewhere. You can also opt for split decisions. It's up to you. I've got the scorekeeping chores. At the end of the show, we'll declare an overall winner. Keep in mind none of the battle outcomes are ever predetermined or known in advance by myself or our judges. So the first category is cost. Ethan, please get us started. Yeah, it's a pretty easy one when Vanguard's in the group and especially VOO. Um, it's only three basis points. Like that's a fantastic deal. I don't care how you look at it. Um, XLG is 20 basis points. So is the other one, IWY. Um, but they're all heavyweights, 360 billion in VOO, 3 billion in XLG, another 8 billion. So they're all obviously really big, really tenured ETFs. Um, I mean, we'll go into it later. The performance story is very different uh, rather than just relying on cost, but it's really hard to argue with a 17 basis point difference. So this one will go to VOO. That's a strong start. Thank you, Ethan. Dave, you're up next. How do you see it when it comes to cost? So this is another diversified U.S. large cap growth battle, which is very important because stocks are the engine for many investor portfolios. And these three ETFs are super cheap, as you would expect, ranging from three to 20 basis points or less than one quarter of 1%. Now, remember, ETF cost is typically not a material issue unless the underlying investments are somewhat identical, which is not the case here. So I call the cost category a split decision, but on absolute cost, VU is the cheapest. That takes us next to exposure strategy. And Dave, you're still up. So break it down for us, please. You know, in diversified growth equity exposure, technology has been the main driver. VU has 28% in technology, while XLG and IWI have 39% and 45% respectively. However, the diversified NASDAQ 100 has even more technology exposure with 57%. And ETF battle viewers know that I strongly prefer the NASDAQ 100 for core growth. So I give the exposure win to the NASDAQ 100 wildcard QQQM 
And in its absence here, I give the exposure win to IWY for extra technology. Ethan, you're up next. Exposure strategy, how do you see it? Yeah, you know what? It's funny. These ones end up being some of the more difficult battles, right? Then like when you have to go through maybe like a thematic uh, picks or whatever, because there's, you know, they could be identical, but there's so much nuance to it. So David's point about the tech, like the IWI, you're getting a lot in tech, you're getting big bets on Apple and Microsoft. Um, So he mentioned the tech weights, but the other thing I like to look at is concentration in the top 10. So you have 60% of the portfolio in the top 10 in IWI, 54% in uh, RLG and only, but still a lot, 31% in um, VOO. So while hindsight, like hindsight's always great, you can look back and say, well, you should have been in mega cap tech for these long. So like, obviously when you sort of take that out and looking into next year, like if this keeps going on and you want to maybe reduce that exposure to tech, I, I like that VOO is just a little bit more diversified in it, like than some of the, you know, some of the other ones, but even though I'm usually a big fan of concentration, like XLG is only 50 stocks, right? Um, it, you're getting a little top heavy in some of these. So um, while, You've benefited by being in mega cap growth for a while. I think going forward, just VOO probably makes a little bit more sense just to maybe kind of reduce some of that reliance on the MAG7 that's been so great this year. So um, overall exposure, I'll go with VOO. That takes us next to performance. So, Ethan, you're still up. Please give us your analysis. Which of these three ETFs stands out? Yeah, and now we're going to sound like going the opposite way. Because that said, okay, yes, if you just bought based on cost, fine, VOO would be your winner. But VOO has lagged one year, three year, five year, 10 year. And by like a lot, like I was looking at the difference on the 10 year, VOO lagged 120% to IWV, right? That's, Matt, that's double the performance, right? And that's um, that's a hard so, fund to beat too, by the way. We all know that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like, so it's just been great to like mega cap tech has been where the trade has been. Um and, you know, unless you were fully in tech, like you just, you, you couldn't have beat. Yeah. So like overall beating the S&P is, is a tough feat. Um, so it's on the, and then the other thing is you do get a little bit more yield in VOL. I don't know if it matters for a play like this. Like you're not really getting that much out of the, the mega cap growth uh, one, but performance, it's so hard to argue with IWY. Like it's just, it smashes every other fund. Um, XLG would be the second one, but um, to beat the S&P is a tough feat, no matter how you slice it. And being mega cap growth has just been the trend. So um, if it was closer, maybe I probably would have given it to VOO, but the fact that it nearly has doubled the performance over the last 10 years is just like unbelievable. So I'll give this one to IWY. Dave, it's your turn on performance. Uh, How do you see it? Well, whenever you have a stock market crash followed by a strong bull market, as we have these past two years, it's important to see the returns combined for a meaningful short-term perspective. As of December 20th, 2023, the two-year returns for these ETFs were up by 6 to 8%. And when you step back over the past 10 years, the NASDAQ 100 strongly outperformed. QQQ delivered 414% in total return, or 18% annualized. And I've been saying for years, the future of investing is leveraged funds and cryptocurrency. This past decade, hypergrowth assets like the three times NASDAQ 100, TQQQ, and the Bitcoin Trust, GBTC, they delivered roughly 20 times and 76 times your money, respectively. Actually, the Bitcoin Trust delivered this 76 return in less than nine years, so these assets outperformed the S&P exponentially. And remember, there are additional important uses for levered funds besides leverage. These funds enable folks to earn more interest through larger cash reserves, and they can amplify tax-free investments through leverage in a Roth IRA. And we all know how much Ron and all investors love the tax-free bucket. Just take baby steps with leverage and only use leverage when you're making money. As usual, I give this growth equity performance win to the mind-blowing three times NASDAQ 100 TQQQ, also known as the American Dream ETF, and the unlevered version QQQM. And in their absence, I give the performance win to IWY. Wow, those are some amazing numbers that you threw out there. Thank you very much, Dave. That takes us next to our mystery battle category. Now, this is where our judges can pick a certain factor or multiple factors that they feel 
are crucial to today's matchup. Um, so, Dave, you're still up. What is your mystery battle category and which of these three ETFs wins it? Well, Ron, it's logical that there is some position size, no matter how small, that enables folks to participate in hyper growth assets like leveraged ETFs and cryptocurrency. Position size is extremely important. And in ETF PM, we could allocate up to 100% of our tactical portfolios in all three of these unlevered diversified growth ETFs. But the NASDAQ 100 is the better portfolio management machine or process, in my opinion. So I give the position size win to the unlevered NASDAQ 100 QQQM. And in its absence here, I call it a split decision. Ethan, you're up next. What is your mystery battle category and which of these three ETFs wins it? I'm going to get a little nerdy on this one. It's about index rules. Um, so VOO and XLG are S&P 500 tracking. Um, and the other one, uh, IWI, is a Russell. And usually it's not a big deal, but I think this year points into something that does come up. And it's Uber was just added to the S&P 500, right? And this was an issue when Tesla was added to Russell had Uber already through this run, right? And they had Tesla before. The S&P has a special screen. So a lot of companies don't get it until later or they have to be profitable. So if you're looking at like in terms of what's more growthy, like if you want to own growth, I think the Russell methodologies tend to tilt more growthy because the S&P won't add these companies until they're profitable. So if you like that growth exposure and want to be pure, I kind of prefer the Russell methodology because they've had like Uber is getting Uber's at all time highs and it's now getting added to the S&P. While if you were in a Russell index, you would have had Uber through this entire run up. So again, it's not a huge problem, but when you do have these like outsized cases, it does come up. So it's just something to think about that. I think the Russell methodologies are a little bit more purely passive if that's what you want. I like that they do maybe pick up some of the growth companies before they have some of their run up. So just on a little kind of the wonky index methodologies, I'm going to give it to IWY just because it's it part of the Russell index family. All right. Well, that's a solid take. Thank you, Ethan. Now we've reached a part of the show where our judges can give us their overall ETF battle winner. So Ethan, you've made some very strong arguments up until now. Do you have an overall winner? <laughs> hindsight capital management loves IWY. You cannot argue with it. Is it still probably being wrong? Mega cap tech for the long term is probably not a bad idea, but VOO and the S&P just stands the test of time. It's three basis points. You're going to beat pretty much every strategy over the long term. There's always going to be outliers. What happened? You know, something will always beat it like year to year. But over the long term for three basis points, you're, you're still getting a lot of tech. You're getting some other things. And also just looking to next year, again, just kind of reducing some of that reliance on the mega caps. Even though all, all of my data point is the IWY, I, I just think VOO is too good of a deal. And I, I, I think that's going to be my, my overall winner. So, Dave, your final chance to weigh in with your overall winner. Give it to us. Well, to recap this growth equity update. Artificial intelligence may disrupt everything somewhat fast. And given the rate of increase in machine intelligence, we may all be underinvested in technology and cryptocurrency. That said, always be prepared for the unexpected and have appropriate risk limits. At times, even the best growth assets require patience and appropriate position size and active risk controls. The three times NASDAQ 100 fell by 79% in 2022, and it lost 73% in the corona crash. Yet the trailing 10-year return is still almost 20 times your money, or 35% annualized, which was nine times the S&P return. And other top leveraged funds like three times FANG, FNGU, three times Semiconductor, SOXL, and three times Technology, TECL, have all done better at times. This past decade, Tekel delivered just over 30X, far more than TQQQ. However, over the past 14 years since TQQQ's inception, the NASDAQ 100 three times outperformed, returning 121 times, which was 27 times the S&P. So I give this diversification growth equity battle win to the phenomenal NASDAQ 100 index, either through the three times wildcard TQQQ or the unleveraged QQQM 
And in their absence, I give the battle win to IWI. Well, our judges have spoken, and according to my final battle scorecard, today's winner is a split decision between VOO and uh, the Triple Qs, TQQQ and QQQM. Those ticker symbols were favored by Dave Krinsis, and he made his arguments very clear. He likes tech. He likes AI, cryptocurrencies, all of that, and feels that that's an important, too much of an important investment theme and trend to miss. And for that reason, he likes that almost 60% exposure of the NASDAQ 100 to technology alone. So, uh, And that certainly has powered performance, historical performance, very strong, strong results, uh, easily outperforming uh, some of the other ETFs in today's battle. Tom making his argument saying, well, listen, you know, VOO and S&P 500 are still very difficult to beat, which is absolutely true. And going forward, well, listen, if tech underperforms and you've got a little bit more of a diversified approach with S&P 500, it's made up of 11 different sectors. Of course, tech is one of the largest among those, but still you've got some other sectors uh, behind it. And um, who knows, in the future, if we get any underperformance from tech, that may actually help uh, the forward-looking uh, performance for S&P 500. Great job to both of our judges for their outstanding analysis. We couldn't have done it without you. And before we let you go, I want to give our judges one final opportunity to, to tell us what their one big takeaway or lesson for investors was in 2023. And, Ethan, uh, why don't you give that to us? Sure. And I agree with a lot of the stuff that David said about tech overall. I like it. And, I mean, <laughs> the Qs are up 50 or so percent this year, right? Like. I remember coming into the year like that wasn't supposed to work right with higher rates like we weren't this is not it's not how this works uh and we got a 50 percent gain in the queues um so i think it really taught me a lesson about staying invested right and staying invested in like quality companies and i, I fell for this trap too like in the beginning of the year i saw international starting to come back i'm like oh this is international's time and i started making the case for international and that fell apart very quickly like not saying you shouldn't be diversified but I, it, you know, being long U.S. companies, U.S. tech, and David said it nicely about the Q sort of like encapsulating innovation uh, is a really important theme. And I think staying invested this year, no matter what, was a, just in the long term, you know, obviously depending what your age and obviously factor all that in. But it really taught me to stay invested because uh, you would have missed the um, even if you bought the S&P, you didn't buy the Qs. You're up 25% this year. Like, amazing. Um, you didn't get that anywhere else. Uh, so um, I just thought, you know, I think stay invested for the long term, focus on lowering your costs, keeping those to a minimum uh, was definitely one of the big lessons from this year. Dave, what is the one big takeaway or lesson for investors in 2023? Well, Ron, I agree with Ethan. My big 2023 takeaway for investors is to beware of the incredible power of technology and artificial intelligence. AI is coming for all human jobs and Bitcoin is coming for all fiat currency. This is not a drill. Be sure to read our book, Investable Benchmarks, and follow the Investable Benchmark portfolio returns online at ETFPM. In 2023, technology stock multiple expansion from artificial intelligence strongly overpowered the headwinds from rising interest rates and geopolitical risk. And as for Bitcoin, it's the world's fastest asset to reach a one trillion market capitalization by far. And SEC approval of a listed spot Bitcoin ETF seems to be imminent. And lastly, this chart shows over 14 years since inception for TQQQ, the peak return was over 210 times your money in less than 13 years. See the ETF PM news blog online from November titled gifts that keep giving. In my opinion, every individual needs to be an owner of the technology matrix. Owning the NASDAQ 100 and the top crypto trusts seems critically important for everyone as the world is racing towards super intelligent automation. Well, both of you gave us some great takeaways for 2023. We appreciate having you on ETF Battles, your awesome insights. We look forward to having you back in 2024. My key takeaway is that as far as investing lessons, 
is that uh, we should all invest with an adequate cushion or what I call margin of safety. That should never be left to chance. And as you get older, your margin of safety should naturally expand or get bigger because you have less time to recover from a major setback. Whereas if you're younger, you can have a, a margin of safety that's a little bit smaller because um, you're focused on growing your portfolio. But nevertheless, I think uh, the regional bank crisis of 2023 certainly taught us that sloppy execution when it comes to the safety of your money. And we saw a lot of sloppy execution, you know, people with multi-million dollar accounts and even some venture capitalists that didn't have adequate FDIC protection on that capital. They were underinsured or not insured at all. Or as Warren Buffett might say, they were swimming naked. So very, very strong lessons for all of us not to have sloppy execution when it comes to the protection of our capital, uh, because it will cause you a lot of st unwanted stress, risk, and maybe even some unwanted results. Well, thank you again to Dave and Ethan, as well as all of our other ETF bail judges for your excellent and timely insights. Uh, keep up the good work. Be sure to visit the description section below. We've got research links to uh, both of our judges. And while you're there, check out the link to our program sponsor, Direction. Well, we'll see you in 2024 for season five of ETF Battles. May good health and juicy profits always be yours. I'm Ron DeLegge. Thanks for watching ETF Battles. We'll see you in 2024.